All right, so here we're going to talk about ketone body synthesis. Now, ketone body synthesis is something that happens after a very long fast. That's when it normally happens. It also happens in states of insulin deficiency, as we're going to see uh, why that happens. So there's not a whole lot that you really need to memorize for this. You more so want to have a, a general understanding of ketone body synthesis, why it happens, and what the implications are. You also want to know where it happens and where it doesn't happen uh, or where ketone bodies cannot really be used. Uh, so we're going to go over some of the generalities of this. We're going to go through the biochemical pathway, but I want you to just have a general understanding of this. If you don't memorize this pathway, it's not really a big deal, uh, as long as you have a general understanding of how this pathway works. Okay, so first of all, uh, ketone body synthesis um, is, is probably really not the best name for this talk. Uh, we're talking about ketone body synthesis, yes, but we're also talking about ketone body usage as well. So we're going to start out with the synthesis of ketone bodies. And first of all, what you need to know is that this occurs in the liver. It specifically occurs in the mitochondria of hepatocytes. So what do we use to make ketone bodies? Well, first of all, remember that this occurs after a long fast. So we've already used uh, glycogen. We've already gone through as much gluconeogenesis as possible. And now we're down to burning fat and burning amino acids. So that is what is used to make ketone bodies. Fatty acids primarily and to some degree, amino acids. In particular, the ketogenic amino acids. You'll want to remember at least two of the ketogenic amino acids. The, the two uh, ketogenic amino acids that are strictly ketogenic, and that's leucine and isoleucine. So what those make is acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA will uh, go through a process to make HMG-CoA. Now, the process is not as important as understanding that HMG-CoA is involved because they're going to try to trip you up a little bit on this. But first of all, acetyl-CoA uh, has a couple enzymes that it uses to get to this point, and those are thiolase and, more importantly, HMG-CoA synthase. Please remember that this is a completely different enzyme from the more famous HMG-CoA reductase, which is completely different. So basically what happens is two acetyl-CoAs, I should write two here, two acetyl-CoAs come together, they, they make uh, acetoacetyl-CoA, and then another acetyl-CoA comes on to that uh, and makes HMG-CoA. So there's another acetyl-CoA that comes in here and makes HMG-CoA. Now, HMG-CoA is also involved in cholesterol synthesis. And what happens here is you have that HMG-CoA reductase. And that makes mevalinate. But this is a completely different process. This has nothing to do with ketone bodies. So I don't want you to think of that here. What I want you to think of is HMG-CoA synthase because that's the most important step in ketone body synthesis. Okay, so instead of HMG-CoA making cholesterol, HMG-CoA is going to make acetoacetate. That's the next step in ketone body synthesis. And the enzyme that does that is called HMG-CoA lyase. And that makes acetoacetate. And acetoacetate is the first of our ketone bodies. Another one, another ketone body that can be made from acetoacetate is beta-hydroxybutyrate. 
Okay, so they're both ketone bodies. And these ketone bodies then go into the bloodstream. So here we have acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Such long words. Okay, those are our two ketone bodies. Now, acetoacetate can spontaneously get converted into acetone. And acetone is volatile, and it, it's not a ketone body that we can use, but it's volatile, it can go into the lungs and be breathed out, and that's what gives that fruity-smelling odor uh, to the patient's breath when they have a lot of ketones in their blood. Now, it's worth remembering that... Let me use this color here. It's worth remembering that ketones, ketone bodies, are mildly acidic. And so when they build up, they decrease the blood pH. And so this is what causes that non-anion gap metabolic acidosis that you get with uh, ketoacidosis. Okay, so you've got acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate in the circulation, and now they're going to go into peripheral tissue where they can be used. Now, it can be used by any peripheral tissue, but the two tissues where it cannot be used, you'll want to remember, are hepatocytes and red blood cells. And that's because they lack some of these enzymes that we're going to talk about uh, as we convert ketone bodies to things that we can use. Okay, so we've got acetoacetate here, and we've got beta-hydroxybutyrate here. I'm just going to write BHB. All right, so we've got acetoacetate. What do we do with it? Well, we're going to convert it to acetoacetyl-CoA. Now, how do we do that? We actually use an intermediate of the TCA cycle that you are probably familiar with, and that's succinyl-CoA. And that's going to donate the CoA uh, to acetoacetate. So we wind up with succinate here. And then we've got acetoacetyl-CoA. Now, the enzyme that does this is called thiophorase. And this is actually what's lacking in hepatocytes and why it's not able, hepatocytes are not able to use ketone bodies. Now we've got acetoacetyl-CoA, and what we do with that is we can make acetyl-CoA. And of course we're making two acetyl-CoAs, so we have to have another CoA coming in here. And then that's really it. So acetyl-CoA then can go into the TCA cycle and we make our NADH, and NADH goes into the electron transport chain and makes ATP. And so that's how we get energy from ketone bodies. Now, the most important tissue that uses ketone bodies is the brain. And so this is very, very important. The brain is going to run on ketone bodies after a prolonged fast. Now, it's also going to be important in diabetes. Why is it important in diabetes? Because we're unable to bring glucose into the cells. So we're going to rely on mobilization of those fat stores to make ketone bodies in the liver and then supply that to peripheral tissue because we cannot take in glucose. So we're reliant on taking in ketone bodies. Uh, in order to uh, get energy and ATP and keep those cells alive. So one way they may ask you a question on ketone body synthesis is that they may tie it in to the TCA cycle. Now this would be definitely a, a harder end question, uh, but it's worth mentioning here because the TCA cycle is one of the most important cycles in biochemistry because it's kind of a central uh, point in a lot of metabolism. So it's worth mentioning here. Now, when you've got ketone body synthesis, let's say you've got diabetes and you need to use fat in order to get energy, then 
you're going to undergo rampant fatty acid oxidation. And when you undergo fatty acid oxidation, you use up a lot of NAD. Why? Because NAD is an oxidizing uh, reagent. Um, it pulls off protons, and so it oxidizes fat. So your NAD stores are going to be very low. Well, what uses NAD? The TCA cycle. You use NAD here. Whoops. You use NAD here. You use NAD here. And you use NAD here. So what's going to happen is the TCA cycle is going to grind to a halt. And so acetyl-CoA is going to build up. What's also going to build up is pyruvate, naturally, because if you don't have NAD, you can't convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. So what that means is that acetyl-CoA is going to be diverted into ketones. Acetyl-CoA is not going to be diverted into uh, making fat. That wouldn't make any sense because we're breaking fat down. It's going to be converted into ketones. Pyruvate is going to be converted to lactic acid. And the reason for that is because we have low levels of NAD. And when pyruvate uh, is, uh, builds up and there's nowhere else for it to go, then NADH is going to reduce pyruvate into lactic acid. And that's going to be favored because we have high NADH relative to NAD. So those are a couple things that they may try to get at uh, on the USMLE. And so, again, if you haven't watched my video on the TCA cycle, I strongly, strongly encourage you to go back and watch that uh, because it's one of the highest yield uh, pathways in biochemistry. So let's just go over the high yield points of ketogenesis. So when do we undergo ketogenesis? We undergo it during conditions of starvation, typically after three days of fasting, or if a patient is insulin deficient. Now this is a gradual process. We don't just uh, we, we don't just uh, suddenly shift to ketogenesis after three days after any. Uh, prolonged fasting, one, two days, uh, we gradually ramp up ketogenesis, but we're pretty much 100% reliant on it after a few days. So if you've ever, uh, if you ever have a patient uh, that's been fasting for a little while and you get a urinalysis and it comes back with mildly elevated ketones, you can do a magic trick and tell the patient, hey, you haven't eaten in a while. And they'll say, yeah, I, I haven't. How did you know that? And it's because they've got ketones in their urine. Now, by the way, I just want to point out that the only ketone we can measure in the urine is acetoacetate. We can't measure beta-hydroxybutyrate. Okay, so that's when we undergo ketogenesis. Well, where does ketogenesis happen? You need to know that it happens in the mitochondria of hepatocytes. Why do we undergo ketogenesis? Because it supplies vital energy primarily to the brain, heart, and skeletal muscle, all very, very important parts of the body. You need your brain and your heart to stay alive, and you need your skeletal muscle to uh, you know, be able to function. How do we undergo ketogenesis? Well, we convert stored fatty acids to uh, acetyl-CoA through beta-oxidation. Remember that the rate-limiting enzyme of ketogenesis is HMG-CoA synthase, which converts acetyl-CoA to HMG-CoA in that, that process. And remember, there's multiple enzymes in that process, uh, but ultimately it makes HMG-CoA. And the key regulators are indirectly the regulators of beta oxidation. Remember that glucagon increases fatty acid oxidation. And so when you have gone a long time fasting, glucagon is going to increase and that's going to increase fatty acid oxidation, which is thus going to increase ketogenesis by increasing your acetyl-CoA and also by, uh, by slowing down the TCA cycle. Uh, now, insulin is naturally going to decrease fatty acid oxidation, and that's going to therefore decrease ketogenesis. Now, why is this important? Because if we have a patient that's insulin deficient, then it's going to 
naturally do the reverse. It's going to increase fatty acid oxidation because our, our levels of insulin are low. And so that's going to increase ketogenesis if you're insulin deficient. And so that's why patients who are, 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 uh, are, are diabetic, um, that's why they're going to uh, have high levels of ketones.